Eugene Debs, um, I think, well, we're, we're in Chapter 11 of A People's History of the United States. Uh, I think we might finish it, but I don't want to promise because we've got to try to keep these episodes to about half an hour, sometimes less, less, sometimes more, but we don't want to push it too much, so let's dig in and find out. Um, two years after he came out of prison, Debs wrote in the Railway Times, the issue is socialism versus capitalism. I am for socialism because I am for humanity. We have been cursed with the reign of gold long enough. Money constitutes no proper basis of civilization. The time has come to regenerate society. We are on the eve of a universal change. Thus the 80s and 90s saw bursts of labor insurrection more organized than the spontaneous strikes of 1877. There were now revolutionary movements about in influencing, excuse me, influencing labor struggles, the ideas of socialism affecting labor leaders. Radical literature was appearing, speaking of fundamental changes, of new possibilities for living. In this same period, those who worked on the land, farmers, north and south, black and white, we're going far beyond the scattered tenant protests of the pre-Civil War years and creating the greatest movement of agrarian rebellion the country had ever seen. When the Homestead Act was being discussed in Congress in 1860, a senator from Wisconsin said he supported it because its benign operation will postpone for centuries if it will not forever, all serious conflict between capital and labor in the older free states, withdrawing their surplus population to create in greater abundance the means of subsistence. The Homestead Act did not have that effect. It did not bring tranquility to the East by moving Americans to the West. It was not a safety valve for discontent, which was too great to be contained that way. As Henry Nash Smith says, and as we have seen, on the contrary, the three decades following its passage were marked by the most bitter and widespread labor trouble that had yet been seen in the United States. It also failed to bring peace to the farm country of the West. Hamlin Garland, who made so many Americans aware of the life of the farmer, wrote in the preface to his novel Jason Edwards, Free land is gone. The, the last acre of available farmland has now passed into private or corporate hands. In Jason Edwards, a Boston mechanic takes his family west, drawn by advertising circulars, but he finds that all land within 30 miles of a railroad has been taken by speculators. He struggles for five years to pay off a loan and get title to his farm, and then a storm destroys his wheat just before harvest. Ouch. That really sucks, and I think that stories like that really do happen, and I think they really do happen all too much for our comfort. Not that you can do anything about a storm. Behind the despair so often registered in the farm country literature of that day, there must have been visions from time to time of a different way to live. In another Garland novel, A Spoil of Office, the heroine speaks at a farmer's picnic. I see a time when the farmer will not need to live in a cabin on a lonely farm. I see the farmers coming together in groups. I see them with time to read, 
and time to visit with their fellows. I see them enjoying lectures in beautiful halls erected in every village. I see them gather like the Saxons of old upon the greens at evening to sing and dance. I see cities rising near them with schools and churches and concert halls and theaters. I see a day when the farmer will no longer be a drudge and his wife a bond slave, but happy men and women who will go singing to their pleasant tasks upon their fruitful farms. When the boys and girls will not go west nor toward the city, when life will be worth living. In that day the moon will be brighter and the stars more glad and pleasure and poetry and love of life come back to the man who tills the soil. Hamlin Garland dedicated Jason Edwards, written in 1891, to the Farmers Alliance. It was the Farmers Alliance that was the core of the great movement of the 1880s and 1890s, later known as the Populist Movement. My dinner. Kale and mango smoothie. Better than it probably sounds. Between 1860 and 1910, the U.S. Army, wiping out the Indian villages on the Great Plains, paved the way for the railroads to move in and take the best land. Then the farmers came for what was left. From 1860 to 1900, the population of the United States grew from 31 million to 75 million. Now 20 million people lived west of the Mississippi and the number of farms grew from 2 million to 6 million. With the crowded cities of the East needing food, the internal market for food was more than doubled. 82% of the farm produce was sold inside the United States. Farming became mechanized. Steel plows, mowing machines, reapers, harvesters, improved cotton gins for pulling the fibers away from the seed, and by the turn of the century, great combines that cut the grain, threshed it, and put it in bags. In 1830, a bushel of wheat had taken three hours to produce. By 1900, it took 10 minutes. Sp specialization developed by region. Cotton and tobacco in the south, wheat and corn in the Midwest. Logical. Land cost money and machines cost money, so farmers had to borrow hoping that the prices of their harvest would stay high so they could pay back the bank for the loan, the railroad for the transportation, the grain merchant for handling their grain, the storage elevator for storing it. But they found the prices for their produce going down and the prices of transportation and loans going up because the individual farmer could not control the price of his grain while the monopolist railroad and the monopolist banker could charge whatever they liked. William Faulkner, in his novel, The Hamlet, described the man on whom southern farmers depended. He was the largest landholder in one county and justice of the peace in the next, an election commissioner in both. He was a farmer, a usurer, a veterinarian. He owned most of the good land in the county and held mortgages on most of the rest. He owned the store and the cotton gin and the combined grist mill and blacksmith shop. The farmers who could not pay saw their homes and land taken away. They became tenants. By 1880, 25% of all farms were rented by tenants and the number kept rising. Many did not even have money to rent and became farm laborers. By 1900, there were four and a half million farm laborers in the country. It was the fate that awaited every farmer who couldn't pay his debts. Could the squeezed and desperate farmer turn to the government for help? Lawrence Goodwin, in his study of the populist movement, says that after the Civil War, both parties now were controlled by capitalists. That's an interesting observation, isn't it? What about before the Civil War? We'll see. 
They were divided along north to south lines, still hung over with the animosities of the Civil War. This made it very hard to create a party of reform, cutting across both parties to unite working people north and south. To say nothing of black and white, foreign born and native born. The government played its part in helping the bankers and hurting the farmers. It kept the amount of money based on the gold supply steady while the population rose, so there was less and less money in circulation. The farmer had to pay off his debts in dollars that were harder to get. The bankers, getting the loans back, were getting dollars worth more than what they loaned them out, than when they loaned them out, a kind of interest on top of interest. That is why so much of the talk of farmers' movements in those days had to do with putting more money in circulation. By printing greenbacks, paper money for which there was no gold in the treasury, or by making silver a basis for issuing money. The silver standard. Huh. It was in Texas that the Farmers Alliance movement began. It was in the South that the crop lien system was most brutal. By this system, the farmer would get the things he needed from the merchant. The use of the cotton gin at harvest time, whatever supplies were necessary. He didn't have money to pay, so the merchant would get a lien, a mortgage on his crop, on which the farmer might pay 25% interest. <coughs> Goodwin says the crop lien system became, for millions of Southerners, white and black, little more than a modified form of slavery. The man with the ledger be became to the farmer the furnishing man, to black farmers simply the man. The farmer would owe more money every year until finally his farm was taken away and he became a tenant. Goodwin gives two personal histories to illustrate this. A white farmer in South Carolina between 1887 and 1895 bought goods and services from the furnishing merchant for $2,681.02, but was able to pay only $687.31, and finally he had to give his land to the merchant. A black farmer named Matt Brown in Black Hawk, Mississippi between 1884 and 1901 bought his supplies from the Jones store, kept falling further and further behind, and in 1905, the last entry in the merchant's ledger is for a coffin and burial supplies. How many rebellions took place against this system, we don't know. In Delhi, Louisiana, in 1889, a gathering of small farmers rode into town and demolished the stores of merchants to cancel their indebtedness, they said. In the height of the 1877 Depression, a group of white, white farmers gathered together on a farm in Texas and formed the first Farmers Alliance. In a few years, it was across the state. By 1882, there were 120 sub-alliances in 12 counties. By 1886, 100,000 farmers had joined in 2,000 sub-alliances. They began to offer alternatives to the old system. Join the alliance and form cooperatives. Buy things together and get lower prices. They began putting their cotton together and selling it cooperatively. They called it bulking. In some states, a grange movement developed. It managed to get laws passed to help farmers. Excuse me. But the grange, as one of its newspapers put it, is essentially conservative and furnishes a stable, well-organized, rational and orderly opposition to encroachments upon the liberties of the people in contrast to the lawless, desperate attempts of communism. It was a time of crisis and the Grange was doing too little. It lost members while the Farmers Alliance kept growing. From the beginning, the Farmers' Alliance showed sympathy with the growing labor movement. When Knights of Labor men went on strike against a steamship line in Galveston, Texas, 
one of the radical leaders of the Texas Alliance, William Lamb, spoke for many, but not all, Alliance members when he sent in an open letter to Alliance people, knowing that the day is not far distant when the Farmers Alliance will have to use boycott on manufacturers in order to get goods direct, we think it is a good time to help the Knights of Labor. Goodwin says, Alliance radicalism, populism began with this letter. Alliance radicalism, populism, began with that letter. The Texas Alliance president opposed joining the boycott, but a group of Alliance people in Texas passed a resolution. Whereas we see the unjust encroachments that the capitalists are making upon all the different departments of labor, we extend to the Knights of Labor our hearty sympathy in their manly struggle against monopolistic oppression and... We, oppose, we propose to stand by the Knights. In the summer of 1886, in the town of Cleburne near Dallas, the Alliance gathered and drew up what became, what came to be known as the Cleburne Demands. The first documents of the populist movement asking such legislation as shall secure to our people freedom from the onerous and shameful abuses that the industrial classes are now suffering at the hands of arrogant capitalists and powerful corporations. They called for a national conference of all labor organizations to discuss such measures as may be of interest to the laboring classes and proposed regulations of railway rates, heavy taxation of land held only for speculative purposes, and an increase in the money supply. The Alliance kept growing. In early 1887, it had 200,000 members in 3,000 sub-alliances. By 1892, five years later, farm lecturers had gone into 43 states and reached Two million farm families in what Goodwin calls the most massive organizing drive by any citizen institution of 19th century America. It was a drive based on the idea of cooperation, of farmers creating their own culture, their own political parties, gaining a respect not given them by the nation's powerful industrial and political leaders. Organizers from Texas came to Georgia to form alliances, and in three years, Georgia had 100,000 members in 134 of the 137 counties. In Tennessee, there were soon 125,000 members and 3,600 sub-alliances in 92 of the state's 96 counties. The alliance moved into Mississippi like a cyclone, someone said and into Louisiana and North Carolina, then northward into Kansas and the Dakotas, where 35 cooperative warehouses were set up. One of the leading figures in Kansas was Henry Vincent, who started a journal in 1886 called The American Nonconformist and Kansas Industrial Liberator. Say, that's quite a title. <laughs> Saying in the first issue, this journal will aim to publish such matter as will tend to the education of the laboring classes, the farmers and the producer, and in every struggle it will endeavor to take the side of the oppressed against the oppressor. By 1889, the Kansas Alliance had 50,000 members and was electing local candidates to office. Now there were 400,000 members in the National Farmers Alliance and the conditions spurring the alliance onward got worse. Corn, which had, bought, which had brought 45 cents a bushel in 1870, brought 10 cents a bushel in 1889. Oh. Harvesting wheat required a machine to bind the wheat before it became too dry, and this cost several hundred dollars, which the farmer had to buy on credit knowing the $200 would be twice as hard to get in a few years. Then he had 
Then he had to pay a bushel of corn and freight costs for every bushel he shipped. He had to pay the high prices demanded by the grain elevators at the terminals. In the South, the situation was worse than anywhere. 90% of the farmers lived on credit. Credit drives our economy, in case it wasn't obvious. To meet this situation, excuse me, debt, debt drives our economy. To meet this situation, the Texas Alliance formed a statewide cooperative, a great Texas exchange which handled the selling of the farmer's cotton in one transaction. But the exchange itself needed loans to advance credit to its members. The bank refused. A call was issued to farmers to scrape together the needed capital for the exchange to operate. Thousands came on June 9th, 19, excuse me, 1888. I keep doing that. Thousands came on June 9th, 1888 to 200 Texas courthouses and made their contributions, pledging $200,000. Ultimately, $80,000 was actually collected. It was not enough. The farmers' poverty prevented them from helping themselves. The banks won, and this persuaded the alliances that monetary reform was crucial. There was one victory along the way. Farmers were being charged too much for jute bags to put cotton in, which were controlled by a trust. The Alliance farmers organized a boycott of jute, made their own bags out of cotton, and forced the jute manufacturers to start selling their bags at five cents a yard instead of 14 cents. The complexity of populist belief was shown in one of its important leaders in Texas, Charles McCune. He was a radical in economics, antitrust, anti-capitalist, a conservative in politics against a new party independent of the Democrats and a racist. McCune came forward with a plan that was to become central to the populist platform, the sub-treasury plan. The government would have its own warehouses where farmers would store produce and get certificates from this sub-treasury. These would be greenbacks and thus much more currency would be made available, not dependent on gold or silver, but based on the amount of farm produce. There were more alliance experiments. In the Dakotas, a great cooperative insurance plan for farmers insured them against loss of their crops. <sighs> Excuse me. In the Dakotas, a great cooperative insurance plan for farmers insured them against the loss of their crops. Where the big insurance companies had asked 50 cents an acre, the cooperative asked 25 cents or less. It issued 30,000 policies covering 2 million acres. McCune's sub-treasury plan depended on the government, and since it would not be taken up by the two major parties, it meant, against McCune's own beliefs, organizing a third party. The alliances went to work. In 1890, 38 alliance people were elected to Congress. In the South, the alliance elected governors in Georgia and Texas. It took over the Democratic Party in Georgia and won three-fourths of the seats in the Georgia legislature, six of Georgia's ten congressmen. This was, however, Goodwin says, an elusive revolution because the party machinery remained in the hands of the old crowd and the crucial chairmanships of important committees in Congress in the state legislatures remained in the hands of the conservatives. And corporate power in the states and in the nation could use its money to still get what it wanted. The alliances were not getting real power, but they were spreading new ideas and a new spirit. Now as a political party, they became the People's Party, or Populist Party, and met in convention in 1890 in Topeka, Kansas. The great populist orator from that state, Mary, Mary Ellen Lease, told an enthusiastic crowd, Wall Street owns the country. 
It is no longer a government of the people, by the people, or for the people, but a government of Wall Street, by Wall Street, and for Wall Street. Our laws are the output of a system which clothes rascals in robes and honesty in rags. The politicians said we suffered from overproduction. Overproduction when 10,000 little children starved to death every year in the U.S. and over 100,000 shop girls in New York are forced to sell their virtue for bread. There are 30 men in the United States whose aggregate wealth is over one and a half billion dollars. There are a half a million looking for work. We want money, land, and transportation. We want the abolition of the national banks and we want the power to make loans direct from the government. We want the accursed foreclosure system wiped out. We will stand by our homes and stay by our firesides by force if necessary, and we will not pay our debts to the loan shark companies until the government pays its debts to us. The people are at bay. Let the bloodhounds of money who have dogged us thus far beware. <laughs> nice. At the People's Party National Convention in 1892 in St. Louis, a platform was drawn up. The preamble was written by and read to the assemblage by another of the great orators of the movement, Ignatius Donnelly. We meet in the midst of a nation brought to the verge of moral, political, and material ruin. Corruption dominates the ballot box, the legislatures, the Congress, and touches even the ermine on the bench. The people are demoralized. The newspapers are subsidized or muzzled, public opinion silenced, business prostrate. Our homes covered with mortgages, labor impoverished in the land, concentrating in the hands of capitalists. The urban workmen are denied the right of organization for self-protection. Imported pauperized labor beats down their wages, a hireling standing army established to shoot them down. The fruits of the toil of millions are boldly stolen to build up colossal fortunes. From the same prolific womb of governmental injustice we breed two classes, paupers and millionaires. Nice speech. A People's Party nominating convention in Omaha in July of 1892 nominated James Weaver, an Iowa pop populist and former general in the human Union Army for president. The populist movement was now tied to the voting system. Their spokesman, Polk, had said they could link their hands and hearts together and march to the ballot box and take possession of the government, restore it to the principles of our fathers, and run it, run it in the interest of the people. Weaver got over a million votes, but lost. A new political party had the job of uniting diverse groups. North, Northern Republicans and Southern Democrats, urban workers and country farmers, black and white. A colored farmers national alliance grew in the South and had perhaps a million members but it was organized and led by whites. There were also black organizers, but it was not easy for them to persuade black farmers that even if economic reforms were won, blacks would have equal access to them. Blacks had tied themselves to the Republican Party, the party of Lincoln and civil rights laws. The Democrats were the party of slavery and segregation. As Goodwin puts it, in an era of transcendent white prejudice, the curbing of vicious corporate monopoly did not carry for black farmers the ring of salvation it had for white agrarians. There were whites who saw the need for racial unity. One Alabama newspaper wrote, The white and colored alliance are united in their war against trusts and in the promotion of the doctrine that farmers should establish cooperatives, stores, and manufacturers, and publish their own newspapers, conduct their own schools, and have a hand in everything else that concerns them as citizens or affects them personally or collectively. 
The official newspaper of the Alabama Knights of Labor, the Alabama Sentinel, wrote, The bourbon democracy are trying to down the alliance with the old cry N-word. It won't work, though. Some alliance blacks made similar calls for unity. A leader of the Florida Colored Alliance said, we are aware of the fact that the laboring colored man's interests and the laboring white man's interests are one and the same. I'd like to thank you for tuning in. We aren't going to finish the chapter tonight. We'll finish the chapter next time. Be there. In the meantime, remember to hit the like and subscribe button and hit that notification bell. So you'll be notified when I make a video. Thank you for tuning in.